I want to try to preach and minister to you today on the subject of being sold out. It's a title. I'm going to try to start a series today on being sold out. Uh, we need to understand God's passion for us and how we need to ignite our passion for Him. I'm going to say that again because I want, you to, I want this to get in your spirit today. God has a passion for me and you. And listen to me. We must ignite our passion for Him. See, do you realize what the cross did for you? I'm going to ask you again, whether you're listening by radio or here today or standing outside, wherever you're at, do you realize what the cross did for you? Yeah. See, it did more than just save you. It did. I know a lot of people, and that'd been, that would have been enough. Believe me, I don't have to go to hell because of the cross. That would have been enough. But God says, I have given the church so much more, and they've not ignited their passion to get into that. See, I really believe that the wood held God on that cross was not the nails. It was his love and his passion for his people. It was his love and his passion for his church, his people, me and you. Right now, I don't care how bad you've been, God loves you. The church needs to hear this today. No matter where you're at, God loves you. Turn to your neighbor and say, God loves you. God loves you. And see, listen, the only way you will ever experience the true meaning of the cross, listen to this, it must, it must become alive in you. It must come alive in you. And see, here's the deal. I really believe there's not a, th th this person's got more of God, and this person's got more of God. God's God, and God's God, and that's the way it is. How much of Him do you want? That is the question. That is the question. Are you satisfied with just coming to church? That's what you'll do. If you're just satisfied just being here today and putting a check mark beside your name, guess what? That's what you'll get. But see, I'm sold out. See, I've got a, I've got a spark in me. I've got something in me that, I, that, I, that won't let go, and I'm not going to let go. I've got something in me I can't get enough of. Hallelujah. I got something in me that when it was tough on the cross, he hung on for Rafferty and he hung on for you and he hung on for the world. Somebody praise him today. He's a good God and he saved our soul. Hallelujah. He, he sold out for us. He didn't get on the cross and say, well, they're going to be half faithful. I'm just going to halfway die. He, he didn't say, you know what, uh, they're going to put me in the grave and I'm just going to halfway die. That didn't happen. He died, but hallelujah, he got back up. He, he said, I know they're going to be mean. I know they got things going on in their life, but I love them so much. The passion of God, the passion of Christ, because he was sold out for me and you. That's what held him on the cross. He loves you. He loves you. So today I've got a, a word I want to give you. If you have your Bible, we're going to be flipping through it, so all your hinges real quick in the, in, the, in, the, in the Testaments. If you have your Bible, Acts chapter 1. Acts chapter 1 is what I, I verse 3 is what I'm going to be reading. I love the Lord. Acts chapter 1 verse 3, title of this sermon is, the series of sermons is sold out. Verse 3 says these words, I'm reading now the King James today. To whom also he showed himself alive, listen to this, he showed himself alive after his passion. After his what? Passion. He showed himself alive after his passion. By many infallible proofs. Being seen of them forty days. And speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. One thing that is lacking in the church today. Is the kingdom of God being preached. See, God showed himself powerfully. God showed himself he was sold out things after his passion. See, there's a wrong theology out today. I'm going to go ahead and break this lie because it's been lied about too long. The theology says that God and Satan are equal. That this theology says that there's a big war. Y'all listen to me. That there's a big old war happening between the two. And they're equally fighting trying to see who's going to win and who's not going to win and who's going to gain control. That is, that is far from the truth. 
That is so far from the truth. Here's the truth. There is no one equal. There is no one greater. There is no one even comes close to the presence of God. There's nothing in this world bigger than my God. There's nobody hey, hey, that can beat my God. There's nothing in this world can stop my God because he's good all the time and all the time. There ain't nobody equal to my God. Y'all realize that same God, listen to me, that same God that the Romans and the Jews tried to kill and put him in a borrowed tomb. I'm glad my God rents a tomb and don't own a tomb. Amen. Hallelujah. That same God that got up out of the dead old cold borrowed tomb is the same God living in me today. Y'all, I want y'all to get that in your heart. Listen to me. That same God is in you today. I, I thought this was very interesting, but in the book of Isaiah, check this out, in the book of Isaiah, it says one day when we see Satan in person, now think about this, Beth, one day when we see Satan in person, we will turn to one another, look at one another, and say these words. I love this out of Isaiah. You mean to tell me that this is the one that fooled the nations? I'm going to get a, whoo, I tell you. You mean to tell me this was the one that caused me so much grief and so much pain and so much anxiety? Well, that little puny thing, that's what the Bible says, that little bitty nothing. And we give Satan praise and, well, I can't believe he's doing this. Stand up and use the name of Jesus and he will flee and get out of your life. Put him under your feet where he belongs. Somebody help me preach. And he'll flee from you because nobody can stand in the name of Jesus. Oh, by the way, I missed you last Sunday. Y'all going to get a double dose today. So I started thinking, when we see him, the Bible says when we see Satan face to face, we're going to turn, I'm going to look at Scott and say, are you for real, really that? That little puny thing tried to mess me up? That little ugly whippersnapper? That little bitty skinny rotten thing messed me up and threw me off? I'm just getting y'all spirit this morning. Because see, y'all are giving Satan too much power. We... Are giving Satan too much power in our minds, in our church settings, in your life, in your finances. We are giving Satan way too much popularity in this thing. Because listen to me, he's puny, he's ugly. I don't know if he's got highlights or not, but he's puny and he's ugly and he's he ain't nothing. Right. Amen. Right. So one day we're gonna look at each other. I'm gonna look at you and say, for real, really, that derailed me. That made me act the way I acted. Well, I can't believe that. So here's the deal. I started thinking, if Satan, think about this in the Bible. Turn over to Genesis real quick. Genesis chapter 2. Genesis chapter 2, verse 15 through 17. See, here's the thing. Satan has a plan. Satan cannot defeat God. Let me teach you just for a moment to lay this platform, okay? I'll preach here in just a moment. But let me teach first. Satan does have a plan. His plan is to steal, kill, and destroy. We know that here. But think about this. When God made man, he said, it is good and I love it. I, it's good and I love it. When he made Adam in the Garden of Eden, he, he made man out of the dirt, the dust of the ground. He breathed into his nostrils, and the Bible said he became a living soul. God loves man. God loves one man. God loves all man. God loves all people. So I started thinking. I started reading the Bible. And I started saying, well, if Satan's got a plan, what is Satan's plan? I'm going to show you something here. I'm going to teach you today. See, Satan said God loves man, but God hates sin. Now think about this. Just for a moment, hang with me, okay? God loves man, but God hates sin. So think about this. I wrote this down. What if what God hates sin gets in what God loves man? What does God do? How does God deal with it? Is God in a dilemma? So God hates sin. God loves man. So what if what God loves or what, what God hates sin gets in what God loves man? How does God deal with it? This may not have blessed you, but I want to bless you. 
Look in Genesis chapter 2. Genesis chapter 2, you there say amen. amen. Verse 15 through 17. Look at this, 15 through 7, real quick. And the Lord, verse 15, Genesis chapter 2. And the, and the Lord God took the man and put him into the garden of Eden, listen to this, to dress it and to keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree, every tree, everybody say every tree. Yeah, of the garden, thou mayest freely eat, verse 17. But of the tree, listen, of knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. Thou shalt surely die. Listen to what God said. If you eat of the tree, you will surely die. Adam and Eve both ate the fruit of the tree. So listen to me. Something that day had to die. Listen to me. Something that day when God says this, when you eat that fruit of that tree, you will surely die that day. Something had to die that day. Notice the next thing. Listen to this that Adam and Eve did. I know this is a lot of scripture, but I got to give this to you. It's a good teaching. Genesis chapter 3, verse 7 and 8. They ate of it. And here's the next step that they did. And I guarantee this is going to relate to you and I today. Verse 7, Genesis chapter 3. And the eyes of them both were opened. And they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. Verse 8. And they heard, listen to this. They heard. You say, Brian, I thought they ate of the tree, the fruit, and they, they knew they were naked, they sinned, but they what? They still heard. See, so listen to me. God will give you a God conscience when you become a Christian. Were I fear for the church today, listen to me, let me teach. Were I fear for Christians today is when they stop hearing the voice of God. When your heart becomes so hard-hearted, you do and you act the way you want to act with no repercussions. When you act and do the things that you want to do, go around, sleep around, this, that, and the other, and there's no God conscience in you, I say beware, Houston, beware, because you've lost your God conscience. And when you can't feel and you can't hear, but you keep sinning with no, no conscience, I'll do what I want to do. I'll act the way I want to act. I'll talk the way I want to talk. I'll go where I want to go. I'll do what I want to do. And it's my life. I'll live how I want to live. You better watch out. I know this may be some old time preaching, but it's good preaching. We as God's people must hear the voice of God. He still speaks. You still got ears. And as long as you have ears to hear what the Spirit of God is saying, you can move in the order of God. Amen. So where it is. So what God says, if you eat of that fruit, something's going to die. They, they got fig leaves. Listen to me. I'm going to teach you. They got fig leaves, and they sold it around them, Scott, trying to hide their nakedness. What God spoke unto me was this. That fig leaf could only live for a little while because it was disconnected from its source. What God is telling me to tell you this morning, me also, you can sin for a little while, and sin is fun for a season, but you will not live, you will die, because you are disconnected from the source of Jesus Christ. See, you can only, you can only survive for a little while. As long as that leaf had oxygen from the tree, it could live. See, God, I don't know about you, hallelujah, but God is the air that I breathe. He's the oxygen in my lungs. He's the great I am. He's my right hand, left hand, feet. He's everything I need. And if I'm disconnected from him, I'll live like a heathen. I'll talk like a heathen. I'll do as a heathen. Amen. Old school teaching, but we're going to bring it on. See, you eventually die because you're disconnected from the source. See, we still have people today trying to cover themselves. We do. We have people still trying to cover themselves. They're trying to cover their sin, make themselves look good and fine. Quote scripture and Bible. I have people come up to me all the time and they say, Brian, you don't, you don't teach deep enough for me. Let me go ahead and tell all y'all something. This is a Kentucky language. Y'all ready? You get Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John down, we may go to Revelation. Listen, it's more than a Sunday feeling. It's more than you coming here and putting a little money in the plate. 
It's more than you teach in a Sunday school class. Hey, hey, God's concerned about Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. He's concerned all week. He's not a Sunday God. Amen. Come on. So truth, we got Christians today covering themselves. Sowing fig leaves. Well, let me go ahead and tell you. You won't survive because you're disconnected from the source. Our source is Jesus Christ. I noticed something. <laughs> Notice what God did in Genesis chapter 3, verse 21. They ate of the fruit. They sinned. They grabbed a leaf. They covered themselves. They heard God's voice walking through the cool of the day of the garden. And God looked at them. And he even asked them a question. Where are you at? I really believe, Glenn, that's what God is still asking the churches today. Where in the world are y'all at? What in the stinking world is the churches thinking today? Yesterday, I, I was in uh, Madisonville, and I'm not going to mention no names, but this is just the truth. <laughs> there was a priest that was in front of me. He grabbed a child. He put two cups of water over his head, and he said, I baptize you in the name of a certain church, and I baptize you unto salvation for the rest of your life. That is not salvation. It is not salvation. And all of a sudden, the pastor asked me, Hi, Brian, how do you think the services went? And so God gave me an opportunity. That's what I thought it was anyway. And so I just told him, I said, Listen, man, I love you. I honor you. I praise God for you. And if you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you're going to heaven just as I am. But we know good and well that a 10-month-old baby don't know nothing about salvation. We know that. Y'all can clap y'all one time. I'm just telling you the truth. We, yes, sir, I sure did. And he looked at me and he said, well, we'll just have to differ on that. And I said, okay, go ahead and be wrong. Amen. It's the truth. There's only one way. Hey, hey, into heaven. His name is J-E-S-U-S. Come on, J. Give me a J. Give me an E. Give me an S. Give me a U. Yeah. Give me an S. Yeah. What's it spell? Jesus. Who forgave you? Jesus. Yeah, 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 yeah. His name is Jesus. That's it. Water would not save you. You Listen, a lot of people get wet. I've seen people get baptized and come out and live like hell. Only one name. Acts chapter 4, verse 12. Check it out. You say, Brian, how you know? Because God, if you're in the Holy Ghost preaching... He'll give you like that. He'll come to you like that. And I'm sitting and telling you today, you say, Brian, did you make him mad? Watch it. I don't care. Amen. See, I've got over trying to be popular and be a popular preacher. What I want you to understand today, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess his name is Jesus. And listen to me. Adam was in the garden. They sinned. They took a bite of the fruit on the tree. They covered themselves like we're trying to cover ourselves. And God looked at him, Brendan. He said these words, what are you doing? Look at this. Y'all got me saying, man, give me five more minutes. Or maybe 10. Bobby said 15. <laughs> you know, I have another one. We'll have an auction real quick. No, I'm joking. <laughs> Look at this. Look at Genesis chapter 3, verse 20. This is a good word. Look at this. Unto Adam also and to his wife did the Lord God make coats of skin and clothe them. I thought about this, Dixie, just for a moment. God finds an innocent lamb. God takes this lamb, and this is going to be gross. This is a rated R scene. Listen to me. The cross is not a PG movie. It's the nastiest thing you've ever seen in your life. They beat him. They put a spear through him. That's why when we take Holy Communion, I don't understand how people sit and gossip and talk and walk out that door when God's alive and we need to praise him while he is here. I don't understand it, but I'm going to preach it. I thought, started thinking about God took an innocent lamb. And I see, I could just see Adam and Eve standing there, coach. God took this innocent, spotless, Lamb, Glenn, here's what he done. He stripped the lamb of his skin. You say, Brian, that's, that's, that's horrible. Listen to me. I'm going to teach you. The, he took the skin of the lamb, 
And there was Adam and Eve. And God took the skin of the lamb and put it, placed it on Adam and Eve. It was bloody, it was nasty, but it was the lamb's skin. And there I thought about Howard, how that little lamb who was stripped of everything that he had, he was standing there and blood was coming off of him because his coat was off of him. I started thinking about God. Y'all help me. Hallelujah. Help me preach this, Lord. I started thinking about God. Got an innocent lamb, Jesus. And then the Lamb of God. How he got that innocent Lamb of God. And how he stripped him of everything that he had. See, we think he had a, a coat on the cross. No, he was naked on the cross. That's where the church is deceived and they're afraid to tell the truth. But he was stripped, an innocent lamb. And that's why I take my salvation. That's why I'm sold out this morning. Because, listen to me, me and you should have actually been the ones that died. We're the ones that sinned. We're the ones that's going through this stuff. We're the ones, listen to me, the Romans didn't kill him. The Jews didn't kill him. Our sin killed him. Everybody's sin killed him. And that's why when God looks down from heaven, listen to this, hallelujah. When God looks down from heaven and he, he seen Jesus, the only way he could look on him was because of the blood. He had the blood on him. And when God looks at me and you today, hang with me just for a moment. When God looks at me and you today, we are guilty, but we are innocent also. I know it's like an oxymoron, but it's so true. We do have sin in our life. But when God looks at us because of the innocent Lamb of God, somebody help me, he died. He got stripped. He got put on the cross. But when God looks at the blood, he sees innocent. He said, that's my son. That's my baby. That's the one who died. They should have died. Hey, but I died in place of them. I don't know about you, but you need to get on your feet and thank the Lord for dying for your soul in this house right now. We take it too light. Come on. Come on. We don't give God enough praise in the house. We don't praise Him enough. We don't praise Him enough. Maybe that's what's wrong with the church today. We forgot what it cost. See, listen to me. You can have all the education in this world and still die and go to hell. See, this world has become so accustomed to churchy people. That's why when I went over to China, I love them people. They'll listen. They'll go to church on a Saturday night, stay all night, tell their wives goodbye, and stay all night and get ready for church on Sunday. We was over in China, and Jason looked at me, and he said, and I said, man, what them people running for? He said, they're going to church. They were going to church. My God, if you call a prayer meeting in a church today, people don't even show up. Not unless a shooting takes place. But if a shooting takes place, the church has to be filled. I remember back in 1988. I'll never forget this, Daniel. Someone wrote a book that said, 88 Reasons Why Jesus Christ is Coming Back. Y'all may not remember that, but I do. I remember that Sunday, there were people around the walls, scared to death. Oh, my God, he's coming back. He's coming back. It scared me to death. I ain't going to lie. I was sitting there going, is he? I was young that time, you know what I'm saying? And I remember the year 2000, Jamie. Remember this? Y2K. <laughs> Y'all remember that? There was people buying pork and beans and gas masks and Lord have mercy. They were, I guess you'll need cast mask. <laughs> <laughs> hey, y'all hired me. I'm sorry. But anyway, <laughs> Bobby says, shut up. <laughs> <laughs> I am what I am. I'm sorry. I apologize if you're listening to my radio. <laughs> Where was I at? Uh, oh, why too <laughs> Y'all remember that man? They was going down in the basements, Jason, and have all that stuff. And, Lord, all the computers are going to crash. Lord, 
Lord, they had me psyched out. I said, Lord, what are we going to do? I was messed up. He didn't come. He didn't come in 88. He didn't come in 2000. But I will tell you when he is going to come. When all his word is preached all across the world. That's right. Exactly. That's what the Bible says in, in Matthew 24. That's when he's going to come back with his word. Because here's why. He made a prophecy in Isaiah. He said when his word goes forward, it won't come back. It can't come back. It won't come back. See, this book is a bloody book. He started out with blood. It's going to end with blood. All from, from cover to cover to testament to testament. It's a bloody book. And I'm so thankful for the blood this morning. See, I, I started thinking, I'm done, Greg. Y'all come. You guys come. This really should have been me and you on that cross. We know that here. But I started thinking about being sold out for God. Can I tell you what's living inside of you is called holy, holy, holy. Listen, be careful. That God who died on that cross sent the Holy Spirit to live in us. Three and one, one and three. My body does not belong to me. I've been bought with the price. And so if that holy thing lives in me and I don't belong to myself, i got to watch out not to mistreat it or pollute it because it's in me. It's in me. I made my mind up. And I wrote this down. I want you guys to think about this just for a moment. When do you know you're becoming a mature Christian? Think about this. Some of you have been in church all your life, including me. But how do you know when you're becoming a mature Christian? And I wrote this down. I want this to get in your spirit. When your flesh can't find you no more. Listen to me, young people. Listen to me, adults, guests in here today. How do you know when you're becoming spiritually mature? When your flesh can't find you no more. When your spirit says to your flesh, hey, you can't find me there no more. I don't go to the bars like I, I used to. You can't find me there no more. When people talk and they fuss and all the time, listen, you know when you become a mature Christian? When you can shut your mouth and listen to the Spirit besides opening your mouth and hurting people. That's when you know you become a mature Christian. When you say, I don't drink no more and I don't cuss no more. You flesh, you can't find me there no more. Why? Because I'm mature in Christ. My flesh can't find me no more. You say, Brian, are you bragging? The Bible says if you boast, boast in the Lord. Yes, I'm bragging on the Lord. Thank God I don't do what I used to do. Thank God I don't act the way I used to act. Thank God I don't... I, mm, thank you, Holy Ghost. I don't need the flesh no more. How do I know I'm becoming mature? I mean, I, I was down here at a, <laughs> a tire place. And I had my ball hat on, and I was up at the counter paying for my tires. And I heard a group of men over to my right fussing and talking about their pastor. And I told you about this one. They were talking about the pastor, what he does wrong, and this, that, and the other. And I would do this, and I would do that, and this, that, and the other. And so, praise be unto God, I turned around, and one of them seen me. They said, where did Brother Brian? Surprise. <laughs> I looked at him. We didn't fuss. We didn't fight. But here's what I told him. I said, why don't you pray for your pastor instead of fussing about your pastor? Yeah. Won't you pray that the Holy Ghost get a hold of him? Yeah. See, watch this. We may disagree to agree, but I stand here today loving you as your pastor. And here's what I told those men. Why don't you, when was the last time you went and laid hands upon him and anointed him with oil and prayed blessings over his life? Well, here's what they said. We don't believe in that. And I'm like, that's why you are like you are. <laughs> so it's funny how people will judge. But I'm sitting and telling you today under the unction of God, 
whether it's a teaching or preaching, pray, pray, pray. Every word that proceeds from your mouth, pray. Pray in the Spirit, pray at home, pray at school. Whatever you got to do, pray in the Holy Ghost. Pray, pray, pray. And if you pray, 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 you won't have room to do all that other stuff. Amen? So here's what I'm asking you and begging you today. I've got a holy thing in me. His name is Jesus. The reason why I'm sold out is because of Him and no other reason in this world. I know one day that Rafford is going to take his last breath. Could be today. If it is, hasta la vista, baby. I'll see you in heaven. You say, Brian, are you for Ask Dana? I'm not afraid to die. Now, I'm going to be honest with you. It's hard for me to say because y'all look at me, there's Reverend, there's Brian, there's Brother. I'm not ready to die right now because there's lost people. I believe right now there's lost people in this church right now. I want to ask you a question. This really bothers me. Why is there a whole row of seats empty in this church? You can go ahead and turn the web off if you want to. Because Listen to me. We're not doing our job. We're not doing our job. Well, that's your job. No, that's our job. And I know I'm making some of you mad because you won't even look at me. But it's true. There, this place should be packed every Sunday. Yes, sir. Every Sunday. And it shouldn't take a killing to do it. Yes, it's truth. So this week, here's my challenge to you. Y'all want to mess people up? If everybody here invites just one person to church, we're out of room. You talk about growing a church. The reason why a church is not growing ain't because the preacher's not doing his job. I'm doing what God's called me. He said, preach and teach the Word of God. Our job is to grow God's church. Amen? Amen. Don't y'all die on me. Y'all getting mad because I'm trying to tell y'all to evangelize. Do what God told you to do. Well, I'll, I'll do what I want to do. Go ahead. How's that working for you? How's that working? It don't work, does it, Ms. Sheila? So here's my prayer. This week, I don't care if you're 95 or 5. Invite somebody to church. And let's make a difference. What's the best way to grow a church? Your testimony. They should want what you've got. Love them and, and just show them. Amen? Are y'all okay? How many of y'all got truth today? How many of you know God was in the house today? How many of you know great things are happening whether you like it or not in this house today? Amen? It's good stuff. Everybody stand to your feet. Come on. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to think about that one person that you can invite to church. Now, here's what we got to do. Let's plan for next Sunday to set out more chairs. Okay? Let's, let's set out more chairs. Here's what I'm challenging. I don't know how many's here. But if everybody, say there's 400 people here right now. And everybody, let's just say 300 adults. If 300 adults invite one guest, we're up to 600 in one Sunday. We can't hold them. So now we've got to start thinking about what our next steps are. So my prayer is this, that one person, Jamie Browning, who's lost, dying, and going to hell, who's going, who are you going to invite? Invite that person. Start praying right now. How do you do it? By being sold out. Sold out to Jesus. Praise team, you all ready? Father God, in the name of Jesus. Lord, I pray today, God, that you just, Lord, put that name on our heart. Put that name on our heart, dear God, that we can win over to you. I started thinking about that lamb, dear God, that precious lamb of God. How it, you were stripped of everything that you had. And Lord, the, the least thing I can do, if you die for me, the least I can do is live for you. <laughs> If you die for me, the least I can do is live for you. So, Father God, today, in the name of Jesus Christ, may we make our minds that we're sold out. We're not turning back. Like Beth said, we're going to stand up. We're going to preach up. Lord, I just thank you for what you're going to do. In Jesus' name, amen. Here's what God just gave me. It's so funny. Somebody write this down because I'm going to preach on this. God, God thought it. Help me out, Holy Ghost. 
Listen to me. God thought it. Jesus brought it. Y'all got it? God thought it. Jesus brought it. The Holy Spirit taught it. And I caught it. Golly. I'm telling you, I don't think like that. Did y'all get it? I don't even, what'd I say? What, what's up? Oh, gosh. Somebody write that down, please. It, hope it's on video. God thought it. Jesus brought it. Holy Spirit taught it. And Brian Keith Rafferty caught it. So if you got that, that's a good word. Let's, have y'all caught it? Are y'all catching this stuff? Woof, the word's going. Are you catching it? Holy Spirit's teaching it. You got to catch it. He taught it. I caught it. <laughs> so, Father God, do your work. If anybody's lost in this house today, you need to be saved. Come on. You need to be saved. You need to come to this altar. You need to get it right with God. You need to repent. Come on to this altar and get it right. You may just want to thank God this morning. I don't know where you're at. But wherever you're at, God will meet you right where you're at. You come.